Thank you, David. Am, am I audible? Okay. So I'm going to talk about my new book, which was just published, called In My Father's House. And I have to say something about the origins of the book, um, which it emerged from a series of uh, seemingly very dry academic studies uh, that were unknown to the public. Uh, and these uh, showed that crime tends to run very heavily in families. These multi-year studies were conducted in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Rochester, Denver, and most recently Chicago in the United States, and in London in the UK. What they found was uh, uh, astonishing because they, the results that in each of these cities over a very long period of time, over more than 50 years, they found that 5% of families account for half of all crime, and 10% of families account for two-thirds of all crime. And where, whichever city you looked at over whichever period of time, the same result came back. And i just say it again because it, it was astonishing to me that 5% of families are responsible for half of all crime, and 10% of families are responsible for two-thirds of all crime. The, this intergenerational uh, transfer of violence, as criminologists like to refer to it, was first documented in a separate but similar study done in Boston in the 1940s, uh, which uh, looked at a sample of 500 delinquent boys in, from working class homes. The study found that two thirds of the boys sentenced by a judge to a reformatory had a father who had been arrested, convicted, and sent to prison. And half of the boys had a grandfather who had been arrested and sent to prison. And half of the boys also had a mother who had been arrested and sent to prison. Equally striking, all of the delinquent boys in the Boston study were white. In part, this racial makeup is a reminder that until the 1960s, at least, until after the second great, great migration of blacks from the South during and after World War II, uh, most crime in the United States, including violent crime, was committed by whites. So when we think back on our famous uh, criminals, we think back to Jesse James in the 19th century in Missouri, or Al Capone in Pro Prohibition-era Chicago, or Bonnie and Clyde in Texas during the Depression. The common and pernicious American stereotype today of young black predators with guns dealing drugs is really a creation of the last 30 years. While it is true that blacks are overrepresented in prison, they still, uh, the, uh, I should say that whites still commit the majority of all crimes in the US. Despite this statistical evidence of the role of family in crime, criminologists have largely neglected, I'm sorry, neglected this line of causality. Instead, looking at such well-known risk factors as bad neighborhoods, uh, poverty, deviant peers at school, drugs, or gangs. These are real issues, of course, but chronologically, a child's life begins at home with his, with his or her own family long before the neighborhoods or friends or classmates have an influence on them. Uh, John Laub, who's one of our leading criminologists at the University of Maryland, has written that scholars have largely avoided focusing on the families because that would tend to suggest that there is a biological or even genetic basis for crime, which could get the criminologist who says something like that labeled as a racist. Because these studies were so little known by the public, to me they represented an opportunity during 15 years that I wrote about crime and criminal justice for the New York Times. I wanted to try to find a white family with a large number of members who had been sent to prison, both as a way to refocus on the family and as a way to try to disentangle race from crime. By happenstance, an official at the Oregon Department of Corrections told me that he had a family that he thought had six members, a white family that had six members who were in prison. And he offered to let me interview 
the members of the family in prison if I came to Oregon. At that time, I was living in Boston, but, so, but I was intrigued by the family, and I went out, and um, little did I know that after 10 years of working on this project, I would find that the real total of members of the family in prison was not six, it's six zero, 60 members over four generations of this family, known as the Bogles. And the Bogles had a story to tell how criminals often grow up in criminal families. What you are raised with, you grow to become, Tracy Bogle told me. He was the first of the men that I talked to in prison. He was serving a 16-year sentence for a crime that involved uh, kidnapping, armed robbery, aggravated assault, car theft, and uh, sodomy. He would committed the crime with his older brother, older brother, Bobby Bogle, And in my first interview with Tracy, he unintentionally handed me the theme of the book. He said, if I'd been raised in a family of doctors, I'd be a doctor today. But I was raised in a family of outlaws. And the only law we knew were cops coming to break down our doors, coming to arrest us or to send us to jail. Tracy's story, in some ways, was a familiar story about the power of imitation among children, imitation of their parents or their older brothers or sisters or grandparents. Doctors we know often have children who grow up to become doctors. Lawyers have children who grow up to become lawyers. For the Bogles, it was a story about family values, although not just the family values we normally mean when we talk about family values being good. The Bogle criminal, criminal pater familias, uh, as Bobby and Tracy told their stories, was their father, who was known as Rooster Bogle. Rooster was a short man with large protruding ears uh, and a dark curly hair and a nasty temper. He was not the most violent member of the family. That, belonged, that distinction belonged to his eldest son, Tony, uh, who with his wife, Paula, were convicted of murder in Tucson, Arizona, where Tony is serving a life sentence in prison. But Rooster was the most malignant member of the family, spreading what his boys came to call the family curse, like a criminal contagion, which infected almost everyone in the family over four generations. As Bobby told me, Rooster hated toys and sports. The only thing fun for him was stealing so he took us out with him to burglarize our neighbors' houses or steal their cows or chickens or take their mail out of their mailbox, particularly social security checks if they could find them. And one night, Rooster led his whole clan uh, to the big Bonville Dam on the Columbia River and broke into the fish hatchery. And they took, out, they took as many coho and Chinook salmon as they could load into Rooster's truck. Their mother, Kathy, served as the lookout waiting in the truck while they were inside the wire, and then she drove the getaway vehicle. So it was a, a burglary by the whole family. Rooster also did not believe in celebrating Christmas or birthdays. And years later, while he was incarcerated in the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem, Bobby could remember only one Christmas when his father gave him a Christmas present. It was a heavy metal wrench in a plain brown paper bag presented with no explanation. Bobby was only four years old at the time, and he was a little stumped as to what this was. But then he recalled what he'd heard around the family dinner table in excited conversations, his father boasting about the burglaries that he'd done when he was younger. So Bobby decided that his father had given him a burglar's tool. And the next morning, which was actually Christmas Day, he snuck out of the house before dawn, and with his older brother, uh, um, Tony, broke into a nearby grocery store. In the back of the store, there was a caged-in area with a padlock on it, uh, where there were all the Coca-Cola bottles were stashed. And Bobby used this great big wrench to break open the padlock and got the Coca-Cola bottles and took them, home with, took them home with him to have a family celebration. When he walked in the door with all the bottles, Rooster was elated. He said, yes, that's my boys. It was as if he was celebrating 
a school report card with straight A's or a Little League baseball home run. Bobby told me, my father had been encouraging us to steal practically since I was born. He taught us stealing was good as long as we didn't get caught. If the boys got caught, Rooster would take, take, cut a switch off a tree and use the branch to uh, whip the boys until their backs and legs were covered with blood. So, Bobby said, we were a crime family where stealing was fun and going to prison was the honorable thing to do for your family. One of the happiest moments of Tracy's life occurred when he was eight years old and he and Bobby managed to break into the attic of a bar one evening and snuck up the stairs and waited till after dark when the bar had closed and then went back down the stairs into the darkened room. And they helped themselves to all the cash in the cash register. They stuffed it in a bag and walked home to where they were, what they were sharing with their mother, which was a trailer. And while their mother was still sleeping early in the morning, they took the sack of cash and poured it over her head, which woke her up, and she shrieked with joy. That made Tracy very happy. And when he told the story to me in prison about that, he, he was so happy that tears began to run down his cheeks, and he began to shake. It was as if, in recalling this uh, robbery, that he was able to transport himself over the high walls of the prison, in fact, back, transport himself back in time to that very moment in his mother's mobile home years before. Brewster not only took his children out to commit crimes, he also happily prophesied where that would lead them. Some days he would take his boys to, to, on a, to a lake to go fishing. The route would take them past another prison outside of Salem, um, the, the, the Oregon State Correctional Institution at Salem, which was surrounded by mounds of shiny razor wire. Rooster would gaze at the prison as if he was looking at some ancient castle, and he would say to his boys, look carefully. Remember this, because when you grow up, this is where you're going to live. In fact, as Rooster's seven sons grew older, they all dropped out of school. Bobby left in the seventh grade, Tracy in the eighth grade. Instead of, and instead of attending conventional commencement ceremonies, they graduated to more serious crime. Their favorite as teenagers was to steal big rig trucks, 18 wheelers, which they would drive uh, down Route I-5 from Salem and the Willamette Valley to California, over 300 miles, or east to Boise, Idaho on I-84, more than 450 miles. When they started these capers, Tracy was so young and short that he could barely see over the steering wheel and his feet hardly touched the pedals. He was seven. Altogether, the boys claimed to me that they stole more than 300 big rig trucks. Of course, you'd want to allow for some youth for braggadocio on this, but the number was still large, and the boys were eventually caught and arrested and sentenced to the most secure juvenile reformatory in Oregon. Please allow me a flashback here because the Bogle story actually starts much earlier than Rooster. I was able tr to trace the family back to the end of the Civil War in 1865 in Tennessee, to a tiny farming hamlet called Daylight in the hills of Tennessee, central Tennessee near Nashville. Rooster's ancestors, it turns out, were poor farmers and con men, grifters, who tried for years to trick the federal government in Washington into giving Rooster's great-grandfather a Civil War pension. He claimed that he had been a captain in the Union Army, which he was not. He wasn't even in the Army at all. But they kept trying until the beginning of the First World War in 1914. So like 40 years, they kept filing false petitions to the government. And Rooster's own father, Louis Bogle, continued the family tradition of being a con artist when he moved from Tennessee to Texas in 1921, 
he joined his uncle there, who came from Daylight, Tennessee, and was selling the local specialty, which was nursery tree stock, apple and pe young apple and pear trees. His uncle had made a small fortune with this business and had been able to purchase a house and a new Model T Ford, which is the symbol of the automobile age, which had just arrived in the US. Lewis soon fell in love with a local country girl named L.V. Morris, and he conned her into believing that he was the real owner of the Model T Ford and of the house. And she was so smitten by this, seeing this man with apparently good prospects, that she married him. But then the local economy fell into a depression because the price of cotton dropped, and so Lewis's uncle decided to move back to Tennessee, and in the process he sold his house and took the Model T Ford with him, and Lewis was exposed as a fraud. Luckily, his new wife came to the rescue because as a girl, she had learned how to drive a motorcycle, which young women in Texas in those days did not consider polite. But she, with her motorcycle skills, she went out and found a carnival which was traveling through, and they needed somebody to drive a motorcycle around what's called a motor drum. I don't know if any of you know what a motor drum is, where you drive around the walls, and go up and up and up and up to the top, and then the person driving the motorcycle will raise one hand up, and the customers leaning over the top will drop money into their hands. That's right. Uh, LV and Lewis, in fact, spent the next 20 years working in the carnival, uh, with, which was l largely, and the people that they worked with were, were largely gypsies, and they barely eked out a living, but they supplemented it by making and then selling moonshine during Prohibition. And they sometimes got arrested and went to prison. They lived in railroad cars or tents, moving from town to town each week as the carnival moved on. So there was no time or place really for their children to go to school. So most of their children grew up almost illiterate. Rooster was the last child and in 1958, when he was 16, he joined his brothers and his sister and his mother in burglarizing their neighborhood grocery store. They were then living in Amarillo, Texas, and the burglary was the largest in the history of Amarillo up to that point. They made off with $20,000 from the grocery store. And Elvie sat at the dining room table, as they tell the story, and she had all the money and she would bills out in front of each of the members of the family who had taken part as if she was dealing a deck of cards. But two months later, the police solved the crime. They arrested the Bogles, and Rooster was sentenced to five years in the state penitentiary in Huntsville. It was only after all the boys finally got out of prison and came home that their father and mother decided they should move away from Amarillo um, because the police were picking them up anytime there was something suspicious. So they tried moving to Oregon, to Salem, um, but that did not stop their criminal proclivities, which they simply brought with them. Even now, 60 years after that, there are still 10 Bogles in prison and three who have escaped and are hiding somewhere in Montana and Arizona. One criminologist estimated the cost of a family like the Bogles to society, uh, that the, the, the Bogle family by itself would have cost other Americans a total of $480 million, a rather staggering figure. Finally, I'd like to share a few ideas on what the Bogles and the research on how crime runs in families might tell us about reforming our criminal justice system. One of the oddities about the criminal justice system is that although we spent $282 billion on the criminal justice system last year, the criminal justice system does not keep data on families like the Bogles. That is, when somebody is arrested, the police don't ask them, do you have a father or mother or brother or sister or children who have been in prison? When somebody goes to court, the prosecutor and the judge don't ask, do you have anybody in your family who's ever been to prison? And when a per if a person is convicted and sent to prison, when they arrive in prison, the prison doesn't ask them, do you have a mother or father who's been in prison, or an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or children who've been in prison? 
So nobody really knows exactly how many children there are like this. Um, one way a family-focused approach could make the criminal justice system more effective is if we gather data on this. I don't mean to stigmatize the Bogles, but it's, but it's rather to help them by trying to get them therapy at an early age when they're more easily reached. It might sound intrusive, but it could be as simple as an intake uh, form that you fill out if, when you go to visit your doctor or a hospital and they ask you, Is there, do you have a family history of heart attack or strokes or uh, diabetes or cancer? Um, and we're, we all pretty much, or much are accustomed to answering those questions, and it helps because that can play a, a vital role in whether you're likely to get the condition too. And it's very similar, uh, with, with criminality is passed down in a very similar way we know, because the statistics I was talking about show that the more members of your family you have who have been convicted and sent to prison, the more likely you are to go to prison yourself. So it's similar to what happens medically. Second, a family focus could lead to more therapies or better therapies for young people who are in danger of becoming delinquent. For example, in recent years, there's a new program called multi-systemic therapy, which, uh, is, which uses a highly trained psychologists or social workers to go into the homes of people who have a child or a teenager who's getting in trouble with the law. And the program can be triggered by the youngster appearing before a judge who decides to send them to this therapy rather than sending them to a locked institution. The program will bring this team of specially trained therapists right into the home and, and actually often set up shop there and live there with the family. The trick is to try to get the whole family, not just the one kid who's getting in trouble, but to learn about the father, the mother, the brothers, the sisters, if the grandparents, if they can be found, if they're around. And multi-systemic therapy has treated 200,000 families over the past 10 years in 35 states and 25 foreign countries. And the early results are very encouraging. There's also another way to use a focus on the family to reduce crime. The judge who presided over many of the Bogle's trials uh, over four generations, his name was Alvin Norblad. He was a crusty law and order Republican who favored a lock him up and throw away the key approach. But over years of dealing with the Bogle's, he told me, when the courts try to deal with families like these, we always lose. He said, he said just locking up more Bogle's is not gonna do anything more than cost taxpayers money. So he said, he said, we need another solution to this. He didn't know that at the time, but a few things have emerged since then. And one program came about by accident. After Hurricane Katrina obliterated New Orleans in 2005, uh, a young criminologist at the University of Texas noticed something fascinating, that when, because most state inmates in Louisiana who were in the prisons, come from New Orleans, uh, after Katrina, they couldn't go back home because their houses were gone. So they began moving to Texas, and this criminologist began to survey them at one and three and five year intervals after Katrina to see if their rate of recommitting crimes would go down or would stay the same. And what he found was that the ones who moved away uh, had a much lower rate of recommitting crime and being sent back to prison compared to those who had managed to go back to their homes in New Orleans. And he, what he concluded was that by moving away, these people had been able to, former inmates, had been able to break their social network. And so they were able to get away from the habits that they had learned with their families. And this young criminologist named David Kirk then created a program uh, in Maryland using funds from the Maryland Department of Corrections for inmates who were being released from a prison who lived, whose homes were in Baltimore. Baltimore dominates uh, prison population in Maryland. Uh, 
And they worked out a program under which the state would give inmates who agreed not to go home to Baltimore, but would move to other parts of Maryland. They would give them a housing allowance of $1,200 a month. And quite a few of the inmates have taken the state's offer and have moved, not moved back to their homes in Baltimore, but moved away to other places, taking the housing allowance. And the rate of reoffending for those people has really plummeted. And it's one of the few actually, actually successful programs that anyone can identify. I'm also very happy to tell you that, because it took me so long, 10 years to write this book, to get all the Bogles to talk, that finally, last year, the first member of the family ever in 150 years actually graduated from college. Her name is Ashley Bogle, and she, she was a granddaughter of Rooster. She decided that she didn't want to be like the other members of her family, and she was very good in school, and she got straight A's all the way through high school and all the way through college. And she's now got a job uh, helping work with computers, I don't, can't tell you exactly what, in, the hosp in a hospital right outside of Salem. And she's got, she bought herself a, a, a small apartment, she has a car, and she has a three-year-old daughter who she's raising as a single mom. So she has finally managed to get past this. Um, and every day when she commutes to, from the hospital, to, in her, from her home to the, her, the hospital where she works, she has to pass right by the Oregon State Correctional Institution where many of her family members were locked up. In fact, she still has a cousin who is exactly her age who's inside that prison. But she doesn't dwell on this bizarre coincidence because she has been able to move past it. She no longer uh, needs to live with crime, with violence, or with prison in her life. So I'd like to stop there and invite any of you who have questions, please. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Um, so you mentioned different solutions uh, to help the, the Bogles and everyone in their situation. Uh, the first one, um, here at Google, we have this policy where we always think that more data is better. Um, so you mentioned uh, people should have maybe lists that their parents or their immediate family went to prison. But don't you think there could be a bias introduced if the jury or the judge knows that that person comes from a family of crime? It's a, it's a really, I'm glad you asked that because I, had, I, I wanted to make a comment about that. So yes, I mean, this is a balancing act. Uh, the, the, judge, the, 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 the judge will know, uh, the prosecutors will know if uh, the person themselves had a prior record. But now we're getting to the question of if some member of their family had a prior record. Um, so that, it's, it's, a, it's, I, it's a balancing act. And I don't know the answer, but I'm, actually I was thinking that maybe Google would have an answer as to whether, how you get this data, because it's actually available. Uh, so that in the, every state and every city has a record of people who are sentenced to prison, and they have it on, the, on your computer anytime you want to look, with, whether you Arizona or Texas or California or Washington or Oregon, and you can easily find it. Um, so it's a question of collecting that data and putting it somewhere. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answers to how you balance that, but, but the benefit would be that you could stop more of the members of this family. If the, if the Bogles had been known for, had been publicly, or at least known to the authorities for what they were doing, for all the time that passed, the opportunities were lost to try to change them. But nobody could do it because they didn't fully know. Mm -hmm. So the, the judge who told me, uh, well, this judge went and named uh, Alba Norblad, Albert Norblad, he said that he'd had five families like the Bogles in his court, who all of whom had more than 50 members in prison covering four generations. And he was just wanted to throw his hands up because he had very little he could do about them. But if, he, if they'd been seen earlier, and they could have been some way um, headed away from this. So it, I, I, don't, I don't know the correct answer to your question, but I, I think it's something we have to think about. Okay, thanks. So, so in your talk, you talked about a lot of the socialization that happened about how the child was given the wrench when they were really young, went off and stole all these colas about 
how somebody was talking about this criminal act and it brought tears to their eyes and so on. So how does how does bringing a whole bunch of people into that family and having that, um, I, you mentioned that as one of the solutions, having these people come into the family. How does that help with the whole socialization and glorification of crime that they already have in their family? Does, does that make sense? It, 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 yes, of course it makes sense. It's a good, it's a good question. I think the, the, this, the, pro, the one program that I mentioned, there, there are several others very similar now, but, which are actually now companies that are in the business of doing this. So the multi-systemic therapy actually has its headquarters in Charleston, South Carolina. There's a similar company based in New York, but they're basically now all around the country. And they work to try to find the most positive person in the family, whoever it is. It doesn't matter whether it's a grandparent or a cousin. And then they try to get the, the family member who's the most in trouble and attach the relations between the most positive person and the person most in trouble and try to see if they can get some benefit from a closer relationship between those two extremes. But they also work with the whole family. And I, I saw one program in Jacksonville, Florida, which was quite interesting because the local prosecutor there, uh, instead, when, when kids were starting to get in trouble, um, he, just, he had hired, instead of hiring another prosecutor, he'd actually hired a psychologist. And the psychologist devised a series of weekly meetings and if there was a kid getting in serious trouble, for example, I saw a boy who was five years old who had hit a girl, a boy who had hit a girl, also five, over the head with a brick and fractured her skull. And normally the boy would have been taken in front of a juvenile court judge and sent to some locked juvenile facility, even though he was only five years old. But in this case, the, the prosecutor had set up a team and they, what they did was they brought together people from all different agencies. So they had somebody from the police, somebody from local parole and probation. They had somebody from the school department. They had somebody from the hospital where the, the, each of the kids was born. <coughs> and they sat around a table and they would, they would go around the table asking questions. What do you know about this kid? And the police would know this much. And the parole officer would know another part of it, and the hospital would find out more. For example, the kid, this particular kid, was, his mother was a cocaine addict and born, had been born addicted to cocaine. And, they, they, and the school would, would tell them other stories. So by the time they'd gone around the table, they had learned a great deal more about the kid, and they were able to figure out ways of dealing with him. <coughs> and in Jacksonville, what they did was, because Jacksonville is a large military base and has a large retired military population as Air Force and Navy bases. So they get volunteers and they assign them the volunteers to work with these kids, actually be there in the house. So they will be there when the kid gets up in the morning, make sure he, gets, he or she gets breakfast, then will walk with them to school, and then be there when they get out of school, bring them home. <coughs> If they have homework to do, make sure the homework gets done, make sure they have a proper dinner that night. And in some cases, what they would, the, the prosecutor would do is he would say, uh, the mother or the father have to sign a civil contract. He can't force the family to take the therapy, but if they sign a civil contract, that's enforceable. And then the kid will be in that program for maybe two years. And in, in the case that I'm talking about where the boy, whose name was Freddie, broke the girl's skull with a, with a brick, he was he was had this mentor in his life for two years, and that's now more than ten years ago. And he's he's had no further juvenile record. But having that, been able to figure out what what was wrong with him, understand what I, well, I should have said that they also then discovered that the, the actual father had, was in prison for murder, and but, but only by pooling all these re resources were they able to establish what the family was like and what influences they might have had on the kid. And then you bring in the mentor who can forms this positive role model that the kid didn't otherwise have. So that particular case and the Jacksonville case, a lot of good stuff has happened. It, and it doesn't cost much money. The volunteers are, are free. And it certainly costs a lot less than locking a kid up, which could be $35,000, $50,000 a year, even though they're only five years old. Following up on this, so it sounds like uh, the problem is like when people start doing crime at young age, right? It's fun and profit, right? And they don't get punished. That grows, right? So they get more fun and profit until they commit something serious, get once caught, and then go to prison. So would it help to kind of try to correct them at an earlier age, right? To kind of try to catch for the small crimes and punish them some way. 
or work with them, like you say, therapy, but therapy is just you know, a different word for prison, right? Just milder prison. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I would agree that the therapy is a milder form of prison. I mean, the, 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 the therapy properly done can be very, has proved very beneficial in these cases from the ones that I've looked at and spent some time with. So I don't, I don't and the juvenile prisons are wretched places um, and they, they very seldom have much positive impact on the kid. It seems like many of these programs would be most effective if the people want to change, want to get out of this uh, life of crime. And how many of your interviews did you find that people did want to get out of it? And how often was it, um, were people satisfied with the current situation? That's a, that's a good question. I, uh, so in the Bogle family, most, very few of the people really wanted to get out of it because this is what the values that they had learned. And their, their value system was, I mean, to the rest of us, looks kind of upside down. And it, it was, the, in fact, when they got out of prison, they found it very difficult to cope with the world because in prison, they were used to having everything free and available. I mean, you did, your housing, housing was free, your food was free, you didn't have to pay taxes, and you didn't have to obey the law particularly. So you were able to do what you wanted. Um, and what I was able to spend time with one of the Bogles, Tracy Bogle, when he finally got finished his 16-year prison sentence. I was the all, everybody else in his family was in prison, and nobody could go and pick him up when he got out. So I went, and I spent the next two weeks with him, watching what he had to do, and all the places he had to register and sign up, and what programs he had to do. But he, he just he found it incredibly hard to go to go straight, and he and he, ultimately he said to me the key words he said this just isn't any fun. It was much easier committing crimes, and so he went back and he began committing crimes again because that was what he liked to do, and living living the regular law and order life just wasn't any fun. Yes. Could you share some numbers about about how many families like this that you were able to encounter? Well, so. This, this was sort of the, the, the big one that I encountered. I, I mean, I, I didn't go look, after I started work on this family, I didn't go looking for others. But there were many other branches of, of this family that I also looked at. So there was another branch like Roosters, which I, I, I did the research on them for over a long period of time, but it was just too much to put into the book. And the stories became very repetitive. Um, they, were, they sounded a lot like each other. So my book editor said, you just can't put them all in the book. So I threw away more than half my research. I mean, painful for me, but it made, it made the book a lot easier to read. My editor was right about that. But once I found the Bogles, I, I mean, I heard about other families, but it was just impossible to sp spend that much time doing another family. Uh, so earlier you said that it seemed like uh, some of the family members were totally fine with the arrangement or like way, the way things were going in their family. Um, did you get the impression that like, if at the end of their sentence they were offered the chance to just stay in prison that they would have taken it? <laughs> um, no, I, well, I did meet one person who actually did that, uh, he, who was uh, released from prison but refused to leave be, because, he, because he was actually worried that when he got out he would screw up again and he would commit more crimes and he'd be, have to go back to prison. And he stayed in prison several extra years when he didn't have to. So, I mean, that does happen, but I would say most people, when they're let out, they want to get out, but then they find that life outside is really much more difficult. Um, it's hard to pay your bills for your housing and your food and pay your taxes. Some taxes, not something they ever had to worry about. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was wondering if you had any opinion about uh, alternatives to prison uh, from just community work all the way to uh, to the penal penal abolition movement that uh, is kind of on the fringe, but it exists. There are people who uh, argue for the complete abolition of anything penal and process everything through civil courts. So you're asking about what what are are the alternatives that exist of, instead well, of prison, and more about your opinion about uh -huh. well what did uh, what. If, if you were to set the policy, where should we go? So I would certainly want to have many more alternatives than we, we have now. Um, there, and particularly for younger people who are starting to get in trouble with the law, 
We would want to try to divert them from this. Uh, but, but the criminal justice system in the United States is, is set up to hit people pretty hard as, as soon as you can. So they get very long sentences. American sentencing laws are much tougher than those of almost any other Western country, or, or, or just many more years or life imprisonment or these th uh, three strikes in your outlaws, which other countries just don't have. So we end up with much greater proportion of our population in prison. So I think since 1980, we've put almost 15 million people in prison in this country as separate individuals, not people going back for a second time. So 15 million, and it's almost 10 million children who at some point in their lives have had a parent in prison. Uh, and that's, we, since we know that that tends to create more crime and more criminals, it's, that's not a good solution. Um, but I, specifically, I'm not sure what, which alternative you were looking at. Uh, well, the, um, I mean, I don't have experience with this myself, but my wife was, uh, she, uh, she used to be a, a, a judge in France mm -hmm. and working specifically with inmates. It's a special judge mm -hmm. that in France handles parole and alternatives to prison and also uh, people going out of prison. And so there are alternatives, at least in France, we have alternatives like uh, electronic uh, bracelets or anklets, uh, the, the possibility to work outside and sleep in jail, and, uh, and, and for minor offenses, well, things like community work and so, so on. So you've just given a very good answer as to what we're missing. I mean, we, 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 we don't, as far as I know, uh, we, don't, we don't have people like that. We don't have uh, a judge who uh, watches over people who are released from prison and provides alternatives for them. It, it just it doesn't exist. We, we, we want to lock people up, which is why we have, you know, the, by far the world's largest proportion of our population in jail or prison. So I'm, 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 you're describing something that would be very nice to have in this country, but we don't have it. Well, it's, it's not all rosy in France itself. The, the, the prison population and in prisons are uh, over capacity by a factor of two. And of course, nobody will vote for more money to get people into prison. So uh, last time there was a right-wing government that uh, added more stricter laws like three strikes, three skin you're out and so on. What they just, uh, what they did is that simply instead of commuting all sentences under a year into alternatives, mm -hmm. they started commuting all sentences under two years into alternatives, just out of lack of space in prisons. Maybe it was a good thing, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, that's a much more enlightened and progressive system than we have, because we go for the heavy-duty stuff very quickly. We don't have enough alternatives. Thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you. Thank you.